Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Migration Policy Centre of the European University Institute in Florence. My name is Andrew Geddes. I'm the director of the MPC. It's my pleasure this afternoon to be chairing a session on a book, uh, which actually I also contributed to. So I'm very happy to for us to be discussing this book this afternoon, a, a book edited by one of our speakers this afternoon and contributed to by two of the other speakers. The book is entitled Understanding Global Migration. We're very happy to have Jim Holyfield here with us this afternoon is one of the editors of the book, along with his colleague at Southern Methodist University, uh, Neil Foley. So the book itself, I think, is a really important book because it, it brings together many leading scholars of migration to really provide a fascinating set of perspectives on migration interdependence and, and proposes a new typology of migration. states identifies multiple types beyond the classical liberal type of those states and extends its analysis geographically to think about Asia, Africa, the Middle East and South America. So the book itself, I think, is a really important contribution. We're delighted to be able to discuss it this afternoon. Uh, I will briefly introduce our three speakers. Uh, and the idea is that they'll speak for around 15 minutes each. And then we'll have time for questions and discussion from our online audience. For those who are joining us online, uh, please put your questions into the chat function on YouTube, uh, if that's okay, and then we can uh, get the discussion going that way. So for our speakers this afternoon, I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. First of all, we'll hear from uh, Jim Holyfield, who is Oren Ixon Arnold Professor in International Political Economy in the Department of Political Science at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, where he's also Director of the Tower Center. So Jim is well known for his work on international political and economic in issues, including the book Immigrants, Markets and States, published by Harvard University Press. His uh, very influential book, Migration Theory, Talking Across Disciplines, which he co-edited with Carolyn Brattel, and Controlling Immigration, which I think is now in its fourth iteration as one of the most influential books on global migration published by Stanford University Press. Jim will be then followed by uh, Fiona Adamson, who's Professor of International Relations at SOAS, uh, has research interests in the international politics of migration, mobility and diaspora, with a particular focus on conflict and security. And Fiona's current research projects include a project funded by the British Academy on the diplomacy of forced migration. And our third speaker is Hélène Toilet, who is a permanent researcher at the French uh, National Centre for Scientific Research, at CNRS, and she's based at the Centre for International Research at Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, Hélène's work deals with the politics of migration and asylum in the global south, and she focuses her empirical work and her contribution today on the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I'm very happy that we have these three fantastic speakers with us this afternoon. As I say, they will speak, speak for around 15 minutes. We'll begin with uh, Jim Holyfield, who is going to introduce the scope and contribution of the book. Then Fiona is going to talk in more detail about the chapter she wrote on Turkey. And then Ellen is going to focus on the Middle East. So without further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Jim Holyfield. Andrew, <clears throat> let me thank you and your colleagues for doing such a great job in putting this together. Uh, hopefully we can get the audience uh, focused on this book and uh, maybe with a little luck, some will rush out and buy it. Uh, that's my hope anyway. Um, but this book just came out uh, at the end of last year. Uh, it is entitled Understanding Global Migration. Um, here you can see a cover of the book. Uh, it is a sister volume, as you mentioned, with another book that's published by Stanford, which uh, is called Controlling Immigration. And I suspect many of you know this book already. Uh, so this book is much more focused on uh, the OECD countries, uh, the liberal democracies, if you will, whereas the Understanding Global Migration book is really looking at migration globally um, with a, a special focus on the global south. Um, I've just got three or four things that I want to put on the table uh, as we get into a discussion of this book. Uh, I suspect most of our audience uh, know what's going on uh, with respect to migration globally, so I just want to emphasize a couple of things. And then I want to get into 
a discussion of uh, the concept of the migration state. Uh, when we started the workshop for this book uh, a number of years ago, we had a great meeting in Taos, New Mexico, where SMU has a beautiful campus. Uh, all of you, uh, I think, were there for that. And uh, we, we fairly quickly gravitated to this idea of the migration state, uh, which I really first put forward in a 2004 article in the International Migration Review, I think the the concept itself has got legs. It has uh, really helped us to understand what's going on in terms of migration governance. And then, as Andrew mentioned in his introduction, I want to say a few things about uh, what I call what we call varieties of migration states. Uh, we've been working on that. Uh, I doubt if I will get to say very much about migration interdependence. I think I'll leave that perhaps for the discussion, but that's also a focus for this book. And then we'll segue fairly quickly uh, to let Fiona illustrate some of this uh, talking about Turkey. Uh, and then Hélène Thiolet uh, at Sciences Po will uh, take us into the Middle East and especially the, uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, so the trends, again, just very, very quickly. Um, I think sometimes it's a little surprising to see that Europe uh, has the largest number of migrants uh, globally. Uh, uh, 30 percent uh, uh, in Europe, a lot of migrants in Asia. Uh, the total number is 281 million, uh, with North America actually coming in third place. So this is just a, a quick overview. Uh, why are the trends up? I think everybody understands that international migration has been going up. It has increased 150 percent uh, since 1985 whereas the global population has increased by 60%. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons why migration has been going up. I think everyone understands the push-pull dynamic, uh, supply push, demand pull, as I call it. Uh, we've had revolutions in communication, uh, lots of networks, more social capital, uh, transportation. And of course, one of the things that I really want to stress in this talk is the importance of the rights uh, for migrants. This is something that is still uh, a relatively new dynamic, historically speaking. A uh, couple of final points here. Canada and the U.S. have only 5% of the global population, but those two countries alone still receive 20% of global migrants. So North America is very important. Two final points here to reflect on. North America and Western Europe, they have more international or intercontinental migration, people moving from all over the globe, whereas Asia and especially Eastern Europe, they have more intra-regional migration. So there's a lot of migration in Asia, but it tends to be within the region. Uh, uh, another quick point here is that we, if we look at four international migration flows, uh, obviously there's migration going on north, north, uh, north south. Uh, there is some migration going on, a lot of migration going on north-north. Uh, and of course, we know the migration from the south to the north. Um, what we need to understand is that there's a, a big increase in south-south migration. So a lot of the migration uh, that we see in the world today is going on in the southern hemisphere. So let me quickly just uh, move to talk about the migration state. Uh, I will go through this fairly quickly, and um, I'm sure we'll come back to much of this in the discussion. Uh, just a quick historical note here. Uh, migration has been really the rule in human history. People have always moved. They've had mobility. Uh, so it is the rule, not the exception. Uh, it's really with the advent of the nation state, uh, the Westphalian system in 17th century Europe, uh, and the conquest and settlement that resulted uh, you know, from European imperialism. Uh, all of this changed the nature of the international system, and it, and it changed the way in which uh, migration and mobility uh, are governed. Um, one thing I would just mention, if we look at the causes of migration, uh, uh, as Leo Lukasen uh, points out in the book, war is a, uh, is a constant. It's, it's something that causes a lot of migration. If we needed to be reminded of this, we can see it now in Europe with the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, Leo Lukasen in the book also points out uh, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century that a lot of migration is unfree. Uh, we have indentured uh, migrants, and of course, we have uh, uh, chattel slavery 
uh, which was so prominent, uh, especially in the Americas. Uh, but, but during this period, borders were still relatively open. It's in the 20th century, you know, where we have a lot of war and genocide that we see the closure of states and the hardening of the Westphalian system, especially during the, the dark period of the interwar uh, years. Um, and finally, I just want to stress uh, for uh, this is something we talk about a lot in the book. After World War II, we see a humanitarian turn with a new rights markets dynamic and the emergence of what I call the migration state. Uh, uh, of course, we know that uh, one of the pillars of this system is the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the 51 Geneva Convention on Refugees. So that's just a historical point. Uh, here's a little slide um, which has proved to be quite controversial, uh, but it shows the evolution of the state with the modern state with its different functions. Uh, the state, uh, as I mentioned, was created in Europe uh, in the in the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century, um, uh, and it, it was a garrison state. Its primary function was security, protecting the territory, protecting the subjects. Uh, uh, these were basically absolutist systems, uh, monarchical systems. Uh, in the 18th and the 19th century, the modern state takes on a new function, uh, an economic function uh, with a focus on, on firms. Uh, and this is what uh, Richard Rosecrans called the trading state. Uh, what I'm arguing, uh, what we look at in this book is in the, in the 20, 20th and 21st century, we have seen the emergence of the migration state much more focused on, on issues of social citizenship, welfare, rights, uh, and so forth. Um, and migration is one of the three pillars uh, of globalization. The difference is uh, it is not fully institutionalized like what we see with trade, uh, which has a clear logic that is comparative advantage uh, as institutionalized through the WTO. Uh, we also see a vast increase after World War II in the volume of foreign direct investment, capital flows and finance that is institutionalized through the IMF and the World Bank, uh, with uh, which strive to maintain liquidity in the global economy and to maintain exchange rate stability. Migration, of course, as we have seen, is also increased a lot of mobility, but we don't have a clear uh, international regime uh, for governing migration. Um, we can come back and talk more about this in the in, in the discussion, even though we have now uh, for several years, the global compacts on migration and refugees, which aim to create a system of safe, orderly and legal migration. But very few states uh, have, have, uh, have uh, embraced and ratified uh, this, um, this new compact, um, which is still basically a, a voluntary system, if you will. Um, just very quickly on the characteristics of the migration state, which is an ideal type. Uh, I just list them here. Uh, states that are open to immigration and emigration and returns. States that manage mobility, regulate migration to maximize economic benefits. So we think about migration as part of the, the strategy. It's, it's it, uh, how do states manage migration for strategic purposes. Uh, the gains for the receiving states, manpower and human capital, Canada being a prime example. Gains for the sending states, uh, remittances, returns, brain gains, brain circulation, uh, Philippines being a, a classic example, Mexico, Turkey, which uh, Professor Adamson will uh, discuss momentarily. Uh, these are states which clearly define the status and the rights of foreigners, again, uh, Canada being a prime example and states that have legal provisions for settlement, naturalization, citizenship, and of course, return migration. Uh, I would add finally that full migration states participate in the refugee regime, uh, and they're willing to process asylum seekers and accept refugees. When we think about the dilemmas of migration governance, states are pulled in four different directions. Uh, during more normal times, like we saw, let's say, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, states were preoccupied with markets, that is to say, how many migrants do we need uh, to fill holes in the labor market, what rights, what status do we give to these migrants, but we know that especially since the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, security has become a much greater concern for states controlling their borders uh, to protect uh, against uh, potential terrorist attacks. Uh, if you add culture 
these ideational concerns uh, to the mix, uh, then you've sort of got the perfect storm. So we have seen migration uh, policy, migration governance shift pretty dramatically in, in a direction of security with culture. If you look at the debates in Europe, uh, there's a subtext of the fear of Islam uh, very often in this. Um, so um, unless I put this on full screen, you're not going to be able to see my beautiful slide here. Let me just try this briefly and see. Here you can see that the migration state is not only a four-dimensional game, uh, it is also a three-level game. So migration governance is happening at three different levels. Uh, it's happening at the national level, as we pointed out, with this four-dimensional game. But it, it, it also has very important foreign policy implications. Uh, so it's happening at the international level. Uh, you could go and make reference here to Robert Putnam's two-level games, but it's not just a two-level game that's going on. It's actually a three-level game because we know that migration is also very, very important uh, at, the, uh, at the local level. Um, so let me see if I can get out of that. Okay, here we go. Now, I just want to say a few more things uh, in conclusion about the migration state in practice. And I, I want to raise again this controversial idea of what I call the liberal paradox. Um, and we can talk about whether this paradox applies beyond uh, the settler societies and the liberal democracies. This was a big debate among uh, the, the those who participated in this book. Uh, in 1992, I or in the late late 80s, I began to look at what I called a, a liberal paradox when we think about the dilemmas of immigration control, uh, that the economic logic, uh, the liberal logic is one of openness, free trade, openness to migration, but the political logic of the state is actually one of closure, uh, a, a need to protect sovereignty, of course, citizenship uh, and, and, and nationality. These are the primary institutions of the nation state. Uh, and if you think about uh, democracies, of course, we have to know who who or what is the demos. Uh, and uh, Michael Walzer wrote a lot about this in his book, Spheres of Justice. So what I argue is this is a paradox. Liberal states have to be simultaneously open and closed. And you could see from the four dimensional game that I mentioned earlier that the trade-offs here are often very, very difficult. So, um, I think, uh, Andrew, how are we doing on time? I'm about right where I need to be. Yeah, two or three, it's two or three minutes, okay. Two or three minutes, okay. Well, let me just uh, uh, wrap this up by talking my part of this by saying a few things about uh, what is one of the great innovations of this book, I think, we, where we talk about varieties of migration states. We put forward a new typology of migration states, uh, and I'll just quickly run through this and then uh, I'm not going to have time really to talk about migration interdependence. We can come back to that during the discussion if you want, or maybe uh, uh, Fiona or Hélène will, will mention this in their presentation. But the book, the book comes up with a typology, uh, which is clearly we can look at the classical uh, liberal, I put that in quotes here, settler societies or nations of immigrants, uh, we know that the liberal tradition in these settler societies uh, is a very mixed, uh, a multiple tradition, to quote Rogers Smith. Uh, many of these countries were created, um, you know, with the displacement and the genocide uh, of the native peoples uh, in the Americas, Australia, South Africa, etc. Um, and um, uh, it, but but still, you know, we we still have a category of of states that I would refer to as liberal states. Uh, then we have states that are actually post-imperial states. And of course, there's a tremendous overlap here because if you look at France, Britain, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, these are all post-imperial states, migration states, with all that that entails with the colonial legacies. Uh, and Turkey itself, uh, we'll hear more about this from Professor Adamson, uh, don't forget, is also a post-imperial uh, uh, migration state. Uh, and then, of course, we have many post-colonial uh, migration states. And all of these, many of these are covered in the book itself. 
uh, Kamal Sadiq writing about uh, about India, a great uh, chapter on the Indian migration state. Uh, Gerasimo Tsurapas talking more about North Africa, Levant, the Levant and uh, Egypt. Uh, Hélène Thiolet, uh, who's with us today, talking about the, the, the Gulf countries. Uh, uh, Odi Klotz uh, has a great chapter on South Africa in the book. Um, and then there are some contributors to the book who said, but wait a minute, we have to look at uh, these migration states in a developmental light. Uh, the one who really pushed this idea, I think, was uh, Aaron Chung, uh, who writes about uh, East Asia, Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan. I know that professors Adamson and Tiole also uh, look very much at the developmental logic of the states that they uh, are writing about in this book. So what, what are the characteristics of these different migration states uh, from liberal to illiberal? I know uh, Professor Tiole and Tsurapas talk about the illiberal paradox. We'll hear more about that in a moment. So how does migration governance differ uh, if if we look across uh, the world today, uh, and what are the trade-offs involved? Uh, um, I know that uh, Andrew Geddes's colleague Martin Ruse, you know, wrote a, a prize-winning book about uh, that. There's a rights markets trade-off. Uh, you know, that's also discussed uh, in in this book. So I'm going to stop there, Andrew, and let's segue and hear from. Uh, Professor Adamson and Tiole, and then, of course, Andrew, I would love if we can come back to you to talk about the EU, because you have a chapter in the book on the EU. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jim. That's great. Uh, that's a really nice segue into the book, and also now to hear from Fiona, who's contributed a chapter on Turkey to the book. So Fiona is now sharing her screen, and uh, very happy to and over to you. Okay, great. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see the screen. Um, well, first of all, thanks for organizing this event. And also it's been a great um, pleasure and privilege to be part of this project and edited volume. As Jim said, we've had many fascinating discussions over the process of putting this together. And I think we're all excited that it's now out there in the world for others to engage with. Um, so I, I wrote the chapter on uh, migration governance in Turkey. It's chapter 15 of the volume. And my aim in writing the chapter um, was, I mean, first of all, to engage with some of the concepts that, that Jim has already mentioned, but also to go behind some of the headlines or some of the kind of um, more dominant themes that one sees with relation to Turkey and to try to show some of the complexity of migration governance and migration flows in Turkey. Uh, so the, these two pictures, I think most of us um, are familiar with the fact that Turkey is now the largest host of refugees. I mean, since the Syrian civil war in 2011, um, Turkey has come to the fore as the, the, the state that hosts the most refugees in the world. And here you see a picture of of one of the Turkish state camps. But also historically, I think we often think of, of Turkey as a, a labor sending state. And the other photo here is of Turkish migrants or guest workers arriving in Europe in the 1960s. And what I try to do in the chapter is to contextualize some of these developments and, and give a broader picture of Turkey that engages with Turkey as, oops, now why? Okay, I'm not sure why, oh, here, I'll try this. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, puts, puts current developments in a historical context. And as Jim said, Turkey can be considered as a post-imperial migration state. And by that, we mean that the contemporary Turkish state um, grew out of the previous Ottoman Empire, which covered much more territory than contemporary Turkey. And this, I try to argue in, in the chapter, also has impacts on the development of migration governance in Turkey, but also plays into some contemporary issues that um, I discuss in the chapter and we'll discuss in the presentation. 
And one of the things that I cover in the chapter is looking at the period, the period of the late Ottoman Empire to the development of modern Turkey in 1923 and the many forced migrations that accompanied that period, um, including the, the large Greek Turkish population exchanges, but which is in the in the bottom right hand corner, but also um, the late Ottoman, you know, Armenian um, emigrations, but also that Turkey was also a host to many refugees in this period. So there's a long history of the Ottoman Empire and Turkey being involved in migration and also very formative to um, the, the state formation process. In addition to looking at the historical dimensions, I place Turkey in a regional context because I think this is very important for understanding the nature of the migration state in Turkey. One of the things that we discussed during the workshops for this book and that I'm particularly interested in is we talked about the, you know, does the idea of the migration state travel? And, you know, one thing that I think about think is interesting about Turkey, but also other states that are, I don't want to say that Turkey's in the global south, but I think there's some interesting north-south dynamics that affect migration governance in Turkey. And one can especially see this in the past decade or so um, with respect to Turkey's relationship to Europe. So Turkey is on the borders of Europe. And so, especially in the past 10 years and then with the so-called migration crisis of 2015, 2016, Turkey has played an increasingly important role as a kind of buffer state um, or as part of the EU's migration control strategy. Um, we might hear a bit more from the EU side from Andrew later on, but I think it's impossible to understand the dynamics of Turkey's own migration governance without understanding the, the geopolitical and foreign policy interests, as well as, I mean, this has both liberalizing and illiberal effects because Turkey has also since 1999 been a candidate um, for EU membership. So um, the harmonization process has created liberalizing tendencies, but then the externalization process also creates illiberal pressures. Um, so I talk about that in the chapter. But, you know, often the focus is on Turkey-EU relations, but Turkey's regional position is much more complicated than that. You know, you also have to understand that it's in multiple regional systems. And so, you know, it, there are other migration patterns such as um, circular migration between Georgia and Turkey, agricultural workers, but increasingly, and this is not in the book, but has become more important since the Ukraine wars, Turkey is hosting um, quite a number of refugees from Ukraine, but also Russian um, since, you know, since the start of the war and the mobilization process. Turkey has a significant number of both Russians and Ukrainians. And this I think is representative of the migration flows that have always been there from the Balkans and Georgia and um, the Caucasus. Finally, Turkey is also part of a regional system that includes the Middle East and has been heavily affected by geopolitical dynamics. The Syrian conflict is the most obvious. Um, here's a map of you know, the Syrian refugees hosted across different states, but also one has to think of the war in Iraq and it's also a transit state for um, refugees from Afghanistan. So here again, one can't think of Turkey's migration governance in isolation. It's heavily impacted by what's happening in the region, which in turn is also heavily impacted by US foreign policy, NATO and other um, uh, issues. But these major conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then Syria have all had a, quite a significant effect on Turkey. Finally, and this I think gets less attention, but as in other countries, the migration patterns are, di are diversifying in Turkey. And I think it's very interesting to look at non-traditional forms of migration that don't get as much coverage um, in many studies of Turkey. For example, there's quite a significant um, migration flow from Asia of um, Philippine domestic workers to Turkey. And increasingly, um, there are migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa who are either seeing Turkey as a destination or 
um, as a, a transit state on route to elsewhere. And this, frankly, this also goes hand in hand with Turkey's foreign policy interests. It's been much more active in Africa. There are more flights between Turkey and Africa, and one also sees more migration. Now, as I said at the beginning, um, I think Turkey's often viewed as an emigration state in the past. And indeed, I think this is significant for understanding Turkey's economic development, the role of emigration in the 1960s and 70s, and the role that remittances played in its economic development. However, that has changed in the past years. Turkey is no longer um, as reliant on remittances. And now I think migration between Turkey and Europe is about even in terms of inflows and outflows. What is significant though, is the historical legacies of that past migration and creating a um, population um, that European, but that is also connected with Turkey. And this becomes significant in, you know, Turkey's increasing attempts to engage with this, as a, with this population as a diaspora. Um, past migrants, but also um, citizens abroad. And I, I don't have time to go into all the waves of migration, but this has increasingly become an issue between Turkey and Europe as, as, as the Turkish state views this as a constituency that can mobilize. This isn't in the chapter, but I can just briefly mention the issue of um, the significance of this, of if, if some of you remember um, Turkey's attempts to block NATO membership of Finland and Sweden. And one of the issues that came up um, that is still ongoing with Sweden is how Sweden engages with the Kurdish diaspora connected with Turkey. Um, uh, and that became part of the um, part of the kind of negotiation around whether Turkey will accept uh, will will vote for Sweden as a as a NATO member. I, I can talk about the details of that more. Probably most of you are aware. But, um, you know, Jim had mentioned the importance of economics, culture, rights, but also security. And this is particularly important in the case of Turkey, where migration is really wrapped up with multiple security dynamics um, on the border regions with Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Um, here, I mean, one of my interests is how migration intersects with the ongoing Kurdish conflict in southeastern Turkey, which also took on a new dimension with the Syrian civil war. Um, and so much of the, it, it created a very complex, um, complex issues on the border as the conflict within Turkey became tied with the conflict in Syria. Um, there, there was a formation of a kind of Kurdish quasi-state in Northern Syria. And so this linked very much with, um, with Turkey's own security interests in the in the southeast, and so it's quite an interesting example of how you know there's a lot of discussion about the relationship between migration and, and security, and there's a lot of literature on securitization of how it becomes a symbolic issue. But in the case of Turkey, this I think is very um, you know different in that there is a hot conflict, and so border issues and migration become key to understanding the dynamics of the conflict. So within this context, um, one had the you know, so-called refugee crisis, Syrian refugee crisis 2015-2016, which has had ongoing impacts on Turkey, both in terms of its domestic politics. Um, most you know, Syrians were not in camps. They're, they're living in cities in um, Turkey. And just to give an example of the significance that Istanbul hosts more, has hosted more Syrians than all of Europe. So, it's been a significant domestic issue. And those of you who are following the current elections know that this has also come up in the elections that public opinion has turned to some extent um, against refugees, or it's become much more of a politicized issue, which combines with the um, conflict in the Southeast um, and Syria, because there's an increasing um, attempt to to return or repatriate Syrian refugees to Northern Syria, which also feeds into Turkey's geopolitical interests in, in kind of creating a buffer in Northern Syria. Now, I had already mentioned, um, you know, 
the, the relationship between Europe and uh, Turkey, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the 2015-2016 deal, um, which I won't talk about here, but just to say that that has also intersected with other dynamics, including the conflict in the Southeast, um, and including um, with Brexit. This, these are some older pictures, but um, being in the UK, I was quite surprised to see how Turkey became an issue in the in the Brexit campaign. And so, you know, this symbolic view of Turkey being part of Europe or not became quite a significant issue. But I think what is interesting is, um, you know, partly due to its own security interests, but partly due to externalization pressures from the EU, you see Turkey, like other states around the world, building walls, enforcing its borders, um, here you see pictures of the Turkey-Syria border and the wall there, the Turkey-Iran border and the wall there. But this also feeds into conflict um, dynamics. So in a sense, you know, EU externalization um, policies and funding is having a number of knock-on effects that um, are changing dynamics on the ground. And I think we still don't know exactly how those are going to pan out. And just to conclude here, um, obviously there are significant developments that have happened since the chapter has been written. In addition to the uh, war in Ukraine, which I already mentioned, there was you know, this really um, terrible earthquake in southeastern Turkey and northern Syria in February 2023, which disproportionately affected Syrian refugees who were already in Turkey. Um, in addition, we have the ongoing elections, which, you know, for a while, I think people thought the opposition would win. Now I think people, it's pretty clear that Erdogan will stay in power. But both these issues mean that, you know, the situation with regard to migration, especially on the border with Syria and southeastern Turkey is, ongo is uh, ongoing developments. And um, so I think, I will leave it here because I've probably spoken for close to 15 minutes, but I do welcome questions or um, the opportunity to, to discuss any of these issues in greater detail. Thank you. Great, great. thanks, you spot on, perfect. And uh, I think, as you mentioned, I might say something briefly after uh, Professor Chole on the way that e my EU chapter, which I think has quite a lot of, as you pointed out, in relevant implications for the Turkish case. But uh, without further ado, keep the uh, flow going. I'm delighted to now invite Hélène in Paris, I assume, to take the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me um, um, try and do this. Oops, sorry. Going back to the beginning. Everyone seeing the screen? Thank you. I think so, so, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to you and, and EUI for hosting the seminar and having an opportunity to discuss this fantastic collective work that had been ongoing for quite a while before it became a book. So that's, that's really um, exciting. Uh, my part was to... Um, uh, discuss, uh, describe and discuss uh, migration and migration politics uh, in the Arab Gulf for this uh, broader volume uh, that uh, was trying to describe um, migration across the globe. Um, and for me, it was, um, it was really both um, exciting and a bit challenging, um, as the Gulf has been studied by a very limited number of scholars with regard to migration um, and has long been overlooked in research um, that uh, more broadly deal with migration, migration control, integration or assimilation or incorporation. So the, the literature, the mainstream literature are sort of overlooked these countries, even though their importance quantitatively and I think politically is, is there. Um, one of some of the biases that were um, that plagued the, the perception of migration in the Gulf were mostly the fact that migration, migration politics 
were largely dehistoricized in the Gulf. So mainly focusing on economic processes of labor demand, of, of uh, economies that had boomed rapidly because of the uh, oil economy and that needed labor force, both unskilled and skilled. So that was sort of the rhetoric and the rationale around the understanding of migration in this particular region. Another dimension of our biases uh, when it comes to understanding migration in the Gulf countries is uh, the so-called exceptionalism of Gulf countries. Exceptional uh, because the, the oil renterism that is structuring both the economy, dependence upon uh, income coming from uh, oil and gas, but also that, that really strongly drives the, the political economy and the structures of the state and the relationship between states and, and citizens and the dependence between them and triangulation of this dependence as uh, monarchs are basically channeling the oil revenue uh, through uh, the population. Uh, another dimension was also, and that's the, you know, the authoritarian monarchy relying upon oil resources to maintain their power. Another dimension was also Islam and uh, the ethnic and cultural homogeneity of Gulf nations. The fourth, uh, the third, sorry, um, um, bias that most of us have about the Gulf is that they are considered to be highly exclusionary context where migration is only for work and only temporary in the model of uh, guest worker programs in the US or in Germany or elsewhere, which is in fact obliterating immigration as a fact and notably the settlement of immigrants uh, in these countries. And we, we know that the the, the fantasy of the guest workers program and migration as a wholly temporary process has been debunked uh, for both the US and, and Germany uh, by many authors, but it it's, it's still very much what people have in mind when you think about the Gulf. Um, even though Philip Martin earlier said that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary foreign worker. The fourth dimension of uh, migration that really is there and maybe explain lack of interest in, notably in Western academia, is that uh, migration to the GCC uh, is, is mostly about South-South migration. So uh, immigrants coming from low and middle income countries in Africa, in Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, going to the Gulf in very large numbers. And of course, uh, immigrants coming from the Middle East itself or from the neighboring countries. Um, and a very, very limited number of uh, migrants coming from the global north uh, and almost no flows from the region to the global north. So these particular geographies might explain uh, the relative lack of interest of notably migration theory for the region. So ending this uh, list of scenes of, of migration scholars for not be being too interested in the region, uh, my question when I started writing was how does the region and how does how do migration and migration politics in the Gulf fit into the global understanding of migration uh, and migration politics? And interestingly enough, recently the, the World Bank published its, its 2023 Global Development Report, which is actually giving a lot of space to the Gulf. And that's the first time, at first, that's the first time that the World Bank is devoting a, a global development report to migration and refugees and societies. But also that's the first time that the bank is actually putting really its spotlight on uh, the GCC, and notably in this in this um, pie, you see that the GCC is really spotted as a, a, a large uh, a region where a large proportion of migrants are to be found. Migrants, and actually, I would claim as and refugees, but mostly labeled his here as economic uh, immigrants. So, seventeen percent of uh, the, the migrants of the world 
are in this particular region, uh, which is really uh, important, especially if you compare to the number of inhabitants of the region. So if you're normalized by the population of the region who are non-migrants. Uh, that's also something that we see in a broader uh, map of immigrants across the world. And we see the dark, the dark, whatever color that is, that's red or brown uh, uh, around Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, Kuwait, UAE, etc. So it's really kind of more visible. Um, the interesting thing also, and that's coming from a different source, not the 2023 uh, GDR, but it's it's that these the share of immigrants that are in the GCC is actually growing. So growing from uh, the 2010 to 2090s, and we see here in the uh, red uh, square. Uh, and so it's a very high rate positive change of, of, of 3%. So illustrating what I've said earlier, uh, global data also tell us that the interesting thing about these migration is that they are endogenous to the reason, to the region, sorry, within the Middle East and, and North Africa, Western Asia, but also endogenous to the global South. And we see here under the, the red um, uh, round shape that uh, the main flows in uh, this demographic representation are between South Asia and, and the GCC. Um, and we see these migration corridors also illustrated as uh, the total share of, you know, the one of the top five regional uh, migration corridors in 2019. And it leads us to the, the last uh, uh, part of this statistical description of the importance of this region is how it's uh, for why it's interesting is the proportion of immigrants uh, in the Gulf. And so interestingly, we see that the region is standing out compared to others because of the very large proportion of immigrants in the overall population. In this table, you see that we're ranging from uh, 40, around 40% 40 in Saudi Arabia of the population who is foreign, to almost 90% in Qatar and, and the UAE. And of course, these data are probably uh, underestimated. They're published by each government. Uh, and of course, that's even larger if you look at uh, working age population uh, who are uh, the migrant workers. Um, but in this, uh, in this overall story, uh, what we lacked oftentimes is to rehistoricize these, these facts, this data, and these macro narratives on migration uh, in the Gulf. And an important work, I think, for me in this chapter was to go through the geo history uh, of migration to the Arabian Peninsula as part of broader histories of colonial migration governance, uh, especially when it comes to the early stages of oil explorations that were led by uh, British owned and American owned foreign, uh, so oil companies and not by uh, uh, local rulers. So these created a lot of mobility within the peninsula and with the rest of the British empires, for instance. So Indian migration started very early on. And also it led British and American expatriates to actually settle uh, in the region. The second phase that's also interesting to remember is the post-colonial uh, migration regimes that developed uh, around the 60s, 70s and, and 80s in the wake of pan-Arab political movements and a claim for the autonomy of the region. And in this context, the interesting thing is that migration was mostly reorganized, much less so with the former British Empire and more within the Middle East with partnering between sending countries like Egypt, Jordan, and also a lot of Palestinian refugees who uh, became immigrants in, in the Gulf and formed the, the, you know, the bulk of uh, the labor force on, in you know, both skilled uh, and, and unskilled. And that was very strongly uh, politically motivated. 
So this is just a, an, an image of Aramco officials meeting Bedouins to organize uh, also the labor force mobility to serve the beginning of the oil industry. And that's also one of the colonial legacy uh, in, in the Gulf, the fact that cities were created in the 30s, 40s and 50s around uh, the oil exploitation and they were actually crafted in terms of urban design by oil companies along the lines of racial segregation that would put white expatriate on one on one side, local um, uh, Gulf residents and citizens or subjects on the other, and foreign other foreigners from India, for instance, in another side. So it was a sort of Jim Crow system that was replicated imitating the US context, notably in, uh, in, um, in the region. So that's not some kind of inherent uh, cultural practice, this urban segregation uh, from the region, it was actually imported through colonial ties. An important dimension of this period that's often forgotten is the emergence of religious circulation and pilgrimage uh, that really took off in, in, in the 19th century and the 20th century and was uh, managed uh, by colonial powers uh, to, you know, to organize religious mobility for the, from the entire world, from Africa, from Asia to the region. And that's not, that's not uh, trivial. Uh, so this is just an, an, a, a slide that illustrates the very strong correlation between the oil economy, so oil prices adjusted for inflation, which is the dotted um, line, with uh, migration rates, so migration flows. And you see here that oil was a strong driver of migration, of course, but there were strong changes, the one I illustrated, in terms of the origin of migrants. So migrants from Asian nationalities and, and um, Arab nationalities. So this, this uh, graph illustrates the progressive change across time and uh, the, the rise of um, uh, Arab immigration in the 70s, which later declined and led to a new rise of Asian immigration, you know, connecting with the colonial period. The second point that's interesting to make, I think, is what happened in the 1990s and, and onwards, which is uh, when Gulf states tried to really claim back a better control on migration flows and on immigrants in their countries and use migration politics as a vector of state transformation and consolidation, both internationally so playing on migration interdependencies with countries of origin and using migration diplomacy, and also domestically trying to control better labor markets and immigrant workers. And so these two sides of uh, the migration and state relationship are very important in what I call the sovereign turn, this attempt of states to increasingly control migration. Again, this sovereign turn is not something that is peculiar or particular to the Gulf. It's also something that colleagues, including Andrew or Virginie Girondeau, have talked about in the context of Europe and the United States. So this is an example of one of the consequences of this sovereign turn. In the wake of the 2011 Arab Spring, uh, the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, but others, got a bit scared about the potential contamination and risk that migrants were, were introducing politically in their societies and engaged uh, upon large uh, deportation programs. Here we're seeing Yemeni immigrant, immigrants, sorry, there's also the French version of Yemeni, um, uh, just before deportation in 2013. And the context is that Saudi being a neighbor uh, to Yemen where an Arab Spring was actually happening and a, a democratic revolution was taking place. Uh, the Saudi monarch got a bit scared of the potential democratic contamination and, and uh, laid off a lot of Yemeni immigrants who were actually the first, who were the first nationality uh, of immigrants, of Arab immigrants in the country. 
Um, at the same time, uh, Saudi Arabia also uh, enhance its control on uh, uh, pilgrimage. And the interesting thing here is that we're talking about millions of people who are circulating through Saudi Arabia. So with, with a sort of moral duty to allow mobility at the same time, the state is constraining and restricting uh, uh, migration and trying to better control migration. So this paradox is something that we need to keep in mind. Another important dimension of the 90s and early 2000s is the rise of the Gulf monarchies, Saudi Arabia, but mostly also the UAE and Qatar. Uh, on the, the global scene, the international relation uh, scene, trying to claim more symbolic capital and to, uh, to um, uh, uh, better their image uh, using public diplomacy, mega events, art diplomacy, uh, uh, sports uh, events, and also trying to better the image in terms of migrants' rights. So this kind of liberal uh, trend is to be observed and can be monitored in the signing of agreements and labor uh, reform. It also, this diplomatic dimension was not just for symbols and, and, and getting a better reputation in the international scene. It was also tied to the necessity to articulate better um, with um, uh, sending states and particularly sending states in Asia. And here on this slide, you see that the share of Asian uh, uh, foreigners in the Gulf is actually a very, uh, very, very big. 75% of all foreigners are coming from South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, and their uh, numbers or their share was actually, uh, in, actually increased, uh, particularly so in the UAE and in Qatar. Uh, Arab immigrants remain more uh, numerous in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia. We see here a graph on with the number of Indian immigrants in particular, who is the main nationality overall in the GCC, in the Gulf and the rise uh, of their share within the number, sorry, uh, within uh, all countries of the GCC. Um, so now moving on to the domestic dimension of this sovereign turn, the concern for Gulf monarchies was to better control not only migration at the international uh, level, but also within uh, their countries, and notably to try and better control labor market outcomes. Uh, the context in the Gulf is a very high labor market segmentation where migrant workers occupy a large share of the labor market overall, but particularly so in the private sector. On this graph, you see that the percentage of migrants in the private sector in Bahrain is over 82%. Uh, 96% in Kuwait, 90% uh, in Oman, 80% um, around 80% in Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> almost 100% in Qatar, and 97% uh, in in the UAE. So a, a very strong dependency of private sectors uh, in these countries over foreign immigrants, while the the public sector is actually largely hosting national and serves as a sort of secondary way to distribute the oil rent through public wages to uh, national. So, and one of the story around that was to try and balance better and, and channel more nationals to the private sector to, uh, to uh, lessen the uh, dependency of the private sector on, on foreigners. But of course, the need for private uh, sector workers uh, is still met in all of these countries by a large majority of, uh, if not entirety, uh, of uh, foreign workers. But the control didn't necessarily go through uh, the lowering of the share or of the number of immigrants. It went through uh, the transformation of the governance of uh, immigration and the control of immigrants uh, institutionally the kafala system was uh, allocating the responsibility of controlling immigrants to employers or private citizens. In the 1990s and 2000s, the state started to reform the kafala system, so sponsorship system, uh, and gov governmentalize it, so put it under state control. 
in order to directly control uh, the, uh, the workers. Of course, the kafala system has been criticized a, a great, uh, a lot uh, for allowing exploitation. But a question remains whether or not states are going to be less exploitative uh, than private sector uh, actors. Another dimension of the control over labor market outcome was high subsidies on national workers for them to join the private sector and increased taxation on immigrant workers, either channeled through taxation of uh, firms and employers or direct taxation of migrant workers, that is to say, taxing them, taxing their family. And that's something that was really new and really uh, enhanced the pressure on, on immigrants. The last, um, Andrew, do I have a, a little bit of time left or I'm done? Uh, well, if you could maybe wrap it up in about a minute or so, that would be quite good. Okay. If possible, Leland. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was a bit long. So the last, uh, bit um, of, of the, the research and this chapter was actually trying to highlight the illiberal paradoxes that Jim mentioned earlier that I see uh, enacted in uh, the Gulf societies and in uh, the broader social contract that is tied between uh, the states, the subjects of these monarchs, monarchies and uh, immigrants. So of course we have a context of high exclusion and legal um, and legal uh, obstacles to uh, integration, formal integration with little or no naturalization uh, and anti-immigrants politics of spatial segregation and, and uh, labor market segregation. But that's also something that you find in a lot of countries in the global south and in some countries in, in the global north. Uh, the interesting thing is that where new class-based segmentations were introduced. So when some rights were introduced for um, immigrants in the 2000s, notably, they were in fact segmented and uh, allowed uh, or distributed only to the higher income immigrants and not to the poorer ones. That's interesting, for instance, for residents. So long-term residence is now available in most of the GCC countries, but only for high income immigrants, not for the uh, unskilled and low income ones. And that's really these kind of discrimination based on income is actually not something that is specific to the Gulf. It's something that one finds uh, even uh, in the global north and actually in all countries. Uh, and the uh, example of golden visas that we find in Europe, for instance, is also in the Gulf. Um, but I just want to finish this with a, 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 a potentially hopeful note. So despite these uh, exclusionary context and inequalities, what we find, what I found also in my fieldwork research, is that settlement is happening. And informal forms of cosmopolitan interactions are also happening in the Gulf between foreigners among different groups and also between foreigners and local. And that's uh, something that I think needs to be more uh, studied and discussed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ellen. I think we have three very rich contributions already. We've got some time for questions and discussion and some questions have already been put into the chat box. I just very briefly just going to talk about what the chapter I wrote on the EU in the book because I do think it relates to some of the themes that have been discussed because in that chapter I was looking at the role of the EU as a kind of with this kind of as a unique form of supranational governance which has partial responsibility in the area of migration but for what could be labeled as a more repressive aspects of migration policy the EU focuses essentially on stemming migration while the member states maintain the authority to govern admissions policy. So that aspect of the EU, I think, is particularly important in terms of its policy focus. The second aspect, I think, in relation to the EU is the high level of politicization of migration that's occurred in recent years. It's become quite an important dividing line in European politics and also induce tension between member states. So rather the kind of vertical dynamic of movement towards common European migration policies, what we see is a more horizontal dynamic with uh, shifting alliances between member states, uh, which I think uh, is then evident in the 
what I characterise as a third important trend in the EU, which is agree is the migration policy to non-member states or neighbouring states. I tried very EU is this kind of bad person that will develop and not be EU governance states and for Andrew, I think we lost you there. Your connection is bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. Victoria, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Maybe you could start some of the questions from the chat box. Uh, yes, OK. While we wait for Andrew to come back. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you're back. Sorry about that. I've had to hotspot the phone. A uh, data missed it. Uh, well, yeah, Andrew, I think you still have a very bad connection. Short of time, uh, but I'm very happy that people have. Oh, good. I think you're back with us now, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to try and hotspot my phone. Sorry about this, everybody who's joining us. I don't normally have these kind of problems, but I'm on a very rubbish Wi-Fi because I'm not in my office. Uh... Victoria already posted a question, Andrew, about <clears throat> to me about the the different levels of games that go on. With respect to migration governance, perhaps we could start with that if we yeah, have time. Can, can can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Yeah, you? I can I can I can put the questions. So the questions are from our colleague Midori Okabe at Sophia University in Tokyo. So very happy that she joined okay. us today. And yeah. her question is asking about well, it's asking Jim specifically about migration governance, and she's interested in how the local factor in your analysis makes up the kind of what she calls the win set in dealing with the negotiation for migration governance. So thanks. Yep. We're happy that uh, Professor Kabi has joined us. We also have another question which I've put to all of you, which is from uh, Kamadov Nijad. Uh, I suppose, uh, and and there's a number of comments that uh, Kamadov Nijad has made, which are very, very welcome. But I think in particular about the kind of, I, maybe if I'm interpreting correctly, but the importance of crisis in migration governance, and he refers specifically to the Middle East, uh, and refugee displacement, and also Southeast Asia with the displacement of Rohingya refugees in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. He also asks about international NGOs that can't replace the role of the states and is interested in kind of political solutions for handling refugee crisis, but perhaps the role of crisis in migration mm -hmm. governance and the, the framework here could be relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's some additional comments from uh, Kamadov Nijad, which we thank you for in relation to the IFC, World Bank and UNHCR and some of their recent initiatives. So thank you for sharing that. Our viewers can see those. So maybe go to Jim first, if that's OK. Yeah, um, I do think that as we look across the many states that we cover in this book, that you see uh, actually quite different dynamics in terms of the the different levels of games that are be are being played and if i could just zero in on on japan in particular um uh, i know our, our colleague professor chung is not with us but she's written extensively about this and how important in if you look at the issues of migration governance in japan it's actually the local level and civil society that are driving <laughs> much of the policy debates. So there, there are places like Japan uh, where the local level is, of course, incredibly important. I mean, you could look at the United States, for example, 
um, you know, where we've had this uh, raging debate going on about cities uh, and, and, and states, uh, whether they should, um, we can have sanctuary cities, for example, uh, sort of uh, making a protected area for migrants and refugees. Many cities around the United States have, have done this. Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at the reaction of the federal government or the federal courts, uh, you know, states and local governments are not supposed to interfere with federal or national policies. So you can see the the debates that go on, uh, you know, at, at the subnational level. Um, and I think I will, um, you know, we could we could actually go to uh, Hélène Thulet, who has thought so much about the issue of crisis and how crisis uh, uh, plays a role in migration governance. Uh, I would just uh, I would just say that there's an incredible symbolic element in migration politics all over the world. And I think the the symbolic politics expresses itself through this idea of crisis. Elaine, do you want to say some more about that? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, happy to react, maybe a bit counterintuitively, that um, in the Middle East, migration has not been conceptualized as a crisis uh, for a long time. And the, the, the emergence of this trope of uh, migration crisis is, is quite recent. If you look at the way refugees um, or displaced people have been hosted in the region, in the Middle East, uh, starting with Palestinians in, um, in the 50s, um, Iraqis in Syria in 2003 in the in the wake of the uh, uh, intervention in Iraq, um, Eritreans in Sudan. Um, so these are examples of open door policies with no labeling of mass arrivals of displaced people as a refugee crisis. Um, so it's interesting also to to think of non-crisis where things are not labeled as a crisis, but politically organized uh, as a, a, a legal duty to, to welcome, to open borders, to, to uh, host um, refugees, which is actually what's happening in most of the world. Um, so I guess uh, we need to contextualize better when and why uh, migration is framed as a crisis. Uh, by migration, I mean both forced and economic migration, if you will, um, and maybe sort of reverse the question and look at, you know, at the uh, producers of discourses and, and political entrepreneurs who are actually coining uh, these uh, migration crises and creating uh, mm -hmm. them. And by that, I don't mean to be in any kind of conspiracy <laughs> Uh, theory whatsoever, but just to to really try and look at the way political actors are engaging with migration as a crisis and the kind of opportunities that this open to shape certain policies, uh, to to um, to call for certain ways to govern migration, mm -hmm. largely under a sort of security umbrella to call for extraordinary measures, uh, to step out of legality uh, to, uh, to some extent. And we've seen that at the borders of Europe, uh, legality being uh, pushed aside um, in, in order to uh, enforce better borders and prevent a border crossing. It's very similar to what Fiona has been uh, showing that emerged also in, in Turkey. But I think this really originates from, um, from some very specific areas in the world. And Europe is one of these cradle of migration crisis as a model uh, to, to, ma to manage migration that is spilling over in other regions. But that was not the case in, in uh, the Middle East, not, I mean, historically. Fiona, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, I, I agree with what Ellen has said. And, you know, Jim had said at the very beginning that um, migration is, you know, as old as human history. So I think some of our 
chapters by taking a more historical context, um, placing current, you know, crisis discourse in historical context. Try they try to call into question, um, you know, how much of it is migration as a crisis versus we've seen a shift over time. If you look at Turkey from you know, Ottoman Empire, where there was much more circulation within the empire, the, the border between Turkey and Syria is, you know, relatively new, 100 years. Um, and so, in a sense, the chapter tells the story of the hardening of borders. Um, so I think this historical context is really important. The second thing I would say just briefly on Turkey is in, in, in terms of the question about INGOs can't replace the role of states. There's been a huge variation in how states responded to Syrian refugees. And Turkey, I think, is an interesting example of a, a state that really exercised its sovereignty. Um, as I said in the presentation, most Syrian refugees were not in camps. They were in you know, Turkish society. Many have been you know, quite well integrated. Um, Turkey ran its own camps rather than hosting camps from the UNHCR. So, you know, states, you know, Turkey, Turkey did a relatively, um, well, Turkey, Turkey made great efforts to handle um, the very large number of refugees, 3.5 million on its own. And I think one has to also understand the EU migration deal within that context that, you know, on the one hand, you can look at Turkey leveraging the situation, but on the other hand, you can see that um, the situation also required a great deal of resources and investments by Turkey. So if I could just add to this, uh, the, the extraordinary reception given by Colombia to 2 million Venezuelan migrants, uh, giving them a 10 year residence permits, allowing them to settle without uh, tremendous fanfare. Of course, the Colombians are getting some support on this. And to go back to the crisis issue, at one point, if you looked at this, the, the, the Central American migration to the US and the Southern border, uh, I think this, this quote unquote crisis uh, in terms of numbers uh, ranked only 15th in the world in terms of humanitarian crises. Uh, but if you look at it from the standpoint of the American media, American politics, it was the largest migration crisis on the planet. Well, that was simply not true. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I just wanted to come in on this as well, because the chapter I wrote, crisis played quite a large part of that within the European context. And I think one of the things that I argued in my own chapter is that crisis, in a certain sense, has been normalized within the European Union. Uh, in particular, so if you look at the origins of the European asylum system, it was associated with perceived crisis in arrivals in the early 1990s, particularly towards Germany. But a series of kind of uh, crises have emerged in the European Union, which have been based around concerns, whether real or not, about numbers. And I think more recently supplemented by concerns, whether real or not, about anti-migration backlash in domestic politics across the European Union. So I think this kind of, that as uh, Ellen already pointed out the uh, role of Europe as a, a kind of a hotbed of kind of crisis oriented migration politics is quite a distinctive component. But I think it is centered around concerns about numbers, but also I think the, the politicization of migration in Europe is, is highly significant. Uh, we, we do have another question which I wanted to put to you, and it's, it's uh, from Desiree Mortensen. So thank you for asking this question. It's, it's asking about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, so perhaps I don't know if Ellen would want to answer this, but obviously feel free anybody to join in. But uh, uh, Desir is asking about the migration out of Afghanistan, whether it's been caused more by armed conflict there or by Taliban influence. Uh, so I, uh, I don't know if Ellen would like to start and then anybody else would join in if they want to. I'm, I'm happy to try, but I'm not sure I understand what Taliban influence means in this particular question. Well, if Desiree but... is still with us, could you... Uh, was it possible to uh, clarify? I'm, I mean, if I was to try and interpret on Desiree's part, uh, I, I, I would be assuming the control, the, the, the control of government taken by the Taliban. Uh, ah, okay. I'm, so I would just 
I mean, the, the various conflicts that have plagued Afghanistan from the late 1970s mm. to now have, of course, caused massive internal displacement first and the mass displacement to Pakistan and Iran, mostly. Mm. Uh, and this is where Afghan refugees are until today. Uh, so, of course, armed conflicts, low intensity, high intensity from the Soviet occupation to to now are causing this. And then you have um, a more, let's say, more structural uh, context, which is uh, the contrast, especially since 2001, between a sort of development under aid uh, uh, regime that has been happening in urban areas of Afghanistan and particularly Kabul, of course, which has created some sort of a middle class with aspirations. Uh, and of course, the return of the Taliban into power a year ago has crushed these aspirations and generated a new uh, wave of migration who are a bit different from the kind of ongoing migration that has been um, uh, uh, people who have been going out from Afghanistan in the past uh, decades. So now there is a little bit of a shift linked to the political change in Kabul uh, with a different type of immigrants, highly skilled, a large number of females, and actually very little done, I have to say, in the EU to take this into account seriously in terms of numbers. Uh, especially as a lot of these migrants are coming not necessarily from Afghanistan, but rather from Iran and from Pakistan as sort of secondary movement. Um, so that's my take on this. And I hope I'm not entirely... No, I think um, you've done a great job there, Ellen. Fantastic, because Desiree has now gone into the chat on YouTube. So many thanks for that, Desiree. And she was talking about people leaving Pak uh, are leaving due to fear of the Taliban, such as uh, women, judges. Uh, leaving to go to Pakistan and elsewhere. So I think you touched upon that in your answer. So thank you for that. Uh, I think maybe now we could maybe try and bring things together. And uh, uh, maybe just in case for any final reflections and thoughts, we could maybe just go back to the speakers. If start with Jim, who with Neil Foley was the editor of this collection. For any anything you'd like to, any concluding thoughts from you, Jim? Well, I just want to, <clears throat> again, uh, stress that this is a, uh, I think, somewhat unique volume in the sense that it brings together so many scholars from around the globe, uh, you know, looking at the different migration corridors. I know some of you will um, look at the book and immediately notice that uh, there's one, um, uh, one thing we left out of the book, unfortunately, we didn't have enough space or time, and that's what's happening in Russia and Eastern Central Europe. And of course, we, the book was published before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I would just promise that if there's ever another edition of this book, uh, which if enough of you buy the book, uh, it will be able to go into another edition, then we would make sure to bring Russia and the East more squarely into the picture. Uh, but I do think uh, the, the book offers a great innovation in terms of trying to develop the, this, uh, the varieties of migration states. Uh, we are going to have a special issue of the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. Uh, that will be coming out sometime later this year, uh, where we follow up on this issue of varieties of migration states. So this is a, and if you add to this the whole concept of migration interdependence, which we didn't really get into, and and uh, which is so important uh, if you put it alongside uh, trade interdependence or financial interdependence, uh, I think we need to focus a lot more on that, and we do quite a bit of that in the book. So. So I hope that people will get this book, uh, use it, especially in in their classes. Uh, I think it's a book that uh, is very is a great book for teaching purposes. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Jim. That's great. Let's hope very much there's a second edition, uh, but obviously encourage people to read the first edition, which will help induce the second edition. So thank you. Uh, over to you, Fiona, for any uh, final thoughts. Yeah, just to echo what Jim said is, um, I mean, we've we've tried to give a flavor of uh, of two of the chapters in in in, yep. in the session, but 
I think the breadth of the book, both breadth and depth. I mean, it, I know it sounds like a cliche, but actually, you know, there are chapters on Mexico, Latin America, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, historical chapters. So there's really an incredible breadth of coverage that I think goes far beyond um, many of many of the other books on migration that are out there. So I just encourage people to have a look for themselves. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Ellen, for any final thoughts that you might have. Yeah, very quickly. Um, the I think, I mean, if you ask me, the interest of the book is, of course, to bring a lot of empirical information on various contexts, but also hopefully to to drive new ways of conceptualizing migration, both in its domestic uh, dimension and also international and the connection it, it makes. And so it's it's maybe even more ambition ambitious than it looks, uh, not just you know covering uh, larger geographical space uh, in terms of documenting migration, but also unsettling some of the um, social theories about uh, migration. Great, many thanks for that, uh, and the. Uh, so thanks to our online audience. Thanks to the speakers as well. The book is available from all good internet online book retailers from the publisher. Uh, so we certainly encourage you to get a copy of the book. I also apologise for technical issues, which I've now realised are caused by a massive electrical storm or could be caused by a massive electrical storm that took arriving. So I don't know if that's affected things for me. So I have many apologies for that. But I'd like to thank our speakers, thank everybody who joined us. Uh, encourage people to buy the book and encourage people to follow the work of the authors and of course the Migration Policy Centre EUI and all the things that we do with seminars and webinars and things like that. So please. Andrew, uh, if I could just add one final thought here. Yeah, thanking, sure. Thanking the editors, uh, the great editors at Stanford University Press uh, and especially their pricing policy. I think this book is priced at under $40 in paperback version, which is pretty cheap for a book these days. Yeah. So excellent book and well, a nice price point as well. So I think that's a good concluding uh, <laughs> observation for our uh, today's meeting. So thank you to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.